Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third annual Ed Prep Lab Policy Summit. My name is Steve Wojtkiewicz, and I'm a senior researcher and policy advisor at the Learning Policy Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization committed to advancing evidence based policy that supports equitable and empowering learning for every child. As you can see from our agenda, we've got a full program today. We'll start with a brief introduction to the work of Ed Prep Lab. Next, we'll have a presentation by Linda Darling-Hammond, President and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute and President of the California State Board of Education. Following Linda's presentation, we'll move on to a discussion with our distinguished panelists who we'll introduce in a few moments. After the panel discussion, Linda Darling-Hammond will join us again to offer a few summary remarks, and then we'll proceed to a moderated Q&A session where our panelists will respond to audience questions. As we turn to our brief overview of the work of Ed Prep Lab, let me introduce Maria Heiler. She is the director of Ed Prep Lab, as well as a senior researcher and director of the Washington DC office at the Learning Policy Institute. And now I'll turn it over to Maria. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you all for attending our third annual Ed Prep Lab Virtual Policy Summit. We were excited that you joined us for our focus on building the teacher pipeline, emerging models for high quality educator preparation. Since its launch in 2019, Ed Prep Lab has been committed to transforming the field of educator preparation nationally through the alignment of research practice and policy. To learn more about our work and to explore our extensive resource library, including teacher and leader preparation curricular resources, please visit our website at edpreplab.org. Ed Prep Lab receives project support from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the W. Clement and Jesse V. Stone Foundation, and the Yellow Chair Foundation. Core operating support for all of LPI's work is provided by Heisen Simons Foundation, Hewlett Foundation, Reichs Foundation, Sandler Foundation, and Mackenzie Scott. We thank them all for their generous support. I wanted to take just a minute to share with you some of the important work that Ed Prep Lab has been involved in over the last year. Our research base has focused on deeper learning and equity from our launch with our two studies on preparing teachers for deeper learning and preparing leaders for deeper learning. Simultaneously to this work was a gathering of research related to the science of learning and development. Sold stems from a series of foundational resources you see here published in the Applied Developmental Science Journal which synthesized knowledge across disciplines like neuroscience, learning and developmental psychology, anthropology, and other social sciences to illustrate what we know about how individuals grow and learn. Through these syntheses, which bridge disciplinary silos, sold surfaced key principles about how individuals learn and develop. This growing body of research, next slide please, affirms the research on deeper learning and equity and gives us the tools to help enact these principles. Last year, we launched our integration of this research with SOLD at our spring convening. If you missed it, we'll drop the link into the chat. We built on this at our October forum where we dug into the design principle schools for schools. Next slide. Seen here, which came out of the SOLD Alliance, a group of field leaders and organizations that believe the science of learning and development holds multiple powerful, positive lessons regarding the potential in each and every young person. Several members of, SOLD, of the SOLD Alliance are particularly interested in teacher and leader preparation, including LPI and Bank Street College of Education. So a natural step was to think about how best to prepare teachers and leaders to create these schools and classrooms that the school design principles lay out. Ed Prep Lab took up the charge of seeing what the research says and designing a set of principles, starting with teacher preparation. We assembled an advisory committee made up primarily of Ed Prep Lab faculty that represented expertise across different domains, including learning sciences, culturally sustaining and responsive education, multilingual and bilingual learning, subject specific expertise such as math education and literacy experts, as well as scholars and practitioners with knowledge of exceptional children in inclusive education. The result of this work are these five design principles. Next slide, please. 
that are aligned with the design principles for schools that were on the previous side. And the colors are very similar, but they are there are differences um, that'll be highlighted um, in the next iteration. So these two sets of design principles are the focus of this year's Learning Cafe series. These cafes give participants the opportunity to dive deeper into research and best practices in sold aligned pedagogies. They're open to the public. And next slide, you can see the dates and topics of these remaining for the year right here. Our next two learning cafes are scheduled for February 1st and 3rd and focus on preparing educators to create environments of safety and belonging. And we'll drop the link into chat. Um, we're really excited about the speakers for these two days, uh, and you should definitely get a chance to either register and attend or register and then listen to it um, later, because all of our learning cafes are available online, and this includes an overview of the sole design principles, which was our first learning cafe, and a deep dive into centering authentic relationships in teaching and learning, which features Travis Bristol and Jacqueline Allison from UC Berkeley and the California Residency Lab, which Jacqueline co-leads. And that topic is particularly relevant to today's summit, which focuses on these emerging models. And we hope you're able to join us for the remaining learning cafes and learn more about the work of Ed Prep Lab members while diving deeply into the sole design principles. We're excited about the potential of these design principles to help programs to drill down to how to design the work they do best to prepare their teachers to engage in sole aligned deeper learning and equity practices. To truly leverage change in the field, however, it is critical that the standards that govern educator preparation program approval and accreditation, as well as candidate licensure and certification are transformed. In late 2021, LPI launched the first steps in such an effort through the establishment of a teacher licensure collaborative, or TLC as we call it, a group of national partners and 16 states with four auditing, working to revise teacher licensure and certification standards to incorporate whole child practices, including social emotional learning and ensure alignment with the science of learning and development. This work grew out of LPI's whole child, whole child policy table, which brings together the four major state education policy membership organizations, the Council of Chief State School Officers, National Association of State Boards of Education, the National Conference of State Legislatures, the National Governors Association, and others to support the integration of sold aligned approaches into state education policy. Together with Ed Prep Lab, these partnerships provide the infrastructure to create lasting transformation of educator preparation. Part of the reason I'm sharing about this work is to let you know the exciting things being accomplished through Ed Prep Lab, but also as a backdrop of today's conversation. As we discuss emerging models, some more emerging than others, it's important to think not only about the structure of these programs, but the intent, design, and implementation of them as well. Comprehensive teacher preparation grounded in the science of learning seeks to strengthen the teaching profession and build an educator workforce that is diverse and sustainable, no matter what the model. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Linda Darling Hammond, who's going to share um, about these models and um, their potential for change. She is the president and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute and the current president of the California State Board of Education. She is also the recipient of the 2022 Yidan Prize, which recognized her work in supporting student-centered, equity-focused teacher preparation programs that are grounded in the science of learning and development and prepare teachers to help all students learn in empowering ways. And she will be sharing her presentation, Building the Teacher Pipeline, Emerging Models for High Quality Educator Preparation. Thank you so much, Linda, for joining us today. And I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as you learned from Maria, Ed Prep Lab uh, exists to support powerful teacher education that uses what we know from the science of learning and development about how to teach diverse learners for deeper understanding and to extend that knowledge and capacity to do that by first enabling programs to inquire and improve together. Uh, second, by conducting and sharing research about that preparation and how it works. And third, by working with policymakers to support high quality preparation and well-prepared teachers in each and every community and each and every school. Uh, and those two things, preparing well-prepared uh, edu teacher ed educators and getting them to every school, 
uh, require two different policy strategies that are complementary, uh, because even if every teacher education program in the country offered extraordinary preparation, it would not ensure access to well-prepared teachers for all children because of the large share of positions that are filled by untrained teachers, especially in communities of color and in low-income communities. Uh, so in this time, uh, you know, we need to be working on both of those agendas in collaboration with each other. Uh, even though we know that the single most powerful in-school predictor of student achievement is the presence of well-qualified and experienced teachers, uh, we are doing far too little in the United States right now to ensure that goal, but there are some promising uh, new initiatives that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, we did a study at LPI of positive outlier school districts in California, those that succeeded beyond others in raising achievement for black, Latinx and white students from across household income levels. And we found that the strongest predictor of student success was teacher qualifications and experience as many other um, studies have found. And the strongest predictor of low achievement was the number of teachers on emergency permits and substandard credentials. Uh, just as we need to activate the most skillful teaching possible in this moment of learning recovery uh, in what we hope is a post-pandemic um, era that we're entering, we have tens of thousands of teachers entering without preparation to fill the more than 200,000 classrooms left without qualified teachers due, due to shortages, uh, which are the most severe always in the schools serving the greatest concentrations of students of color and students living in poverty, uh, who then provide the least expert instruction to those who need it more. And the teachers who come in without full preparation uh, are also more likely to leave uh, the teaching profession quickly. Uh, they're two to three times as likely to uh, leave in the first year and uh, more likely also in the subsequent years. That creates churn in the schools, which also depresses student achievement uh, and further exacerbates the shortages. So we get a vicious cycle of people coming in and out who have to be replaced in the next uh, year. Uh, replacing each teacher in urban districts uh, costs about $20,000 per teacher. So there's a real... Um, uh, sort of problem of uh, investing, sort of uh, being penny wise and pound foolish in the way in which we do these investments. According to the Department of Education, all 50 states have reported shortages in more than one area for the school year, uh, especially, of course, including special education teachers, math and science teachers, teachers of English learners. Uh, but in some communities, those uh, shortages are across the board in almost all areas. Um, what's happening is that expectations for teacher learning are being reduced in some states and dropped entirely in some. Florida, for example, now allows military veterans without a BA to teach for five years while they undergo training. Arizona has eliminated the BA requirement entirely. Uh, many other states, in fact, most other states, allow teachers to enter on emergency permits without having preparation in the content areas they will cover or in how to teach those content areas. Uh, but addressing teacher shortages by focusing on getting warm bodies into classrooms won't solve the country's chronic challenges and it will shortchange students uh, at a time when we need to be doubling down on supporting them well. It's critically important that rather than rushing in with Band-Aid approaches, uh, such as lowering requirements that policymakers use this moment and the funds available to us through the American Rescue Plan Act and through other federal and state sources to commit to professionalizing teaching by developing a well-prepared, well-supported workforce that attracts highly qualified candidates who are motivated to become and remain teachers. Uh, and we do see places that are making headway on this, but if we compare the US to other countries, if you were going into teaching in Finland or Singapore about the size of our median state, uh, you would go in uh, with um, full, uh, freely available, uh, high quality preparation program uh, with a salary or a stipend while you were going to school, uh, as well as no tuition to pay, you would, come out and receive mentoring from a trained mentor teacher in your school, uh, and you would be paid equivalently to other uh, college educated professionals, and then get free uh, and uh, well, uh, easily available professional development throughout your career in the 
more than eight extra hours a week that you have for in-school collaborative planning and learning compared to a U.S. teacher. So we have a lot to do to improve the uh, status of the profession and the, and the conditions of teaching. Um, right now, the uh, average U.S. teacher earns about 75% uh, of what a, um, another college-educated uh, worker will earn. Uh, that does vary across the states. It's much better in some states and much less good in others. But the key point is that while teachers tend not to go into the profession uh, for the salary, for the money, they want to make a difference with children, they can't afford to go into a significant amount of debt to go into a profession uh, that is not one of the highly paid professions in our society. And so we've got to figure out how both to focus on um, investing in affordable preparation that is also high quality. And that's where some of these new models really come in. And we also need know that we need to focus on retention uh, because in the United States, about eight or 9% of teachers leave each year, uh, higher in you know, places that uh, are less supportive of teachers, lower in places that are more supportive, but on average, that's still twice as high as what you would see in terms of teacher turnover in places like Finland or Singapore. So if we could reduce attrition by half, we could actually end shortages entirely. And part of what we need to do is bring people in through high retention pathways, uh, pathways that allow them to be well-prepared uh, and to be able to stay in the profession. And this is where these new models of preparation are tackling both quality and affordability. Uh, we know that uh, strong clinical practice opportunities are critically available, uh, critically important, uh, not yet adequately available for um, keeping teachers in the profession and enabling them to be effective. We know that uh, high quality programs have extended clinical practice, typically at least a full year, uh, integrated with high quality coursework that is practical and able to be applied uh, that connects theory and practice. They work in schools that illustrate best practices and they receive expert mentoring as they're learning to teach. And so we see that high quality teacher residencies, which are emerging on the scene uh, and getting a lot of traction in the policy community now, uh, do all of this uh, in their best iterations and they do it with financial supports. Um, the first teacher residency uh, was really created in Chicago uh, and uh, that is actually how then Senator Obama knew about it, writing the first residency bill, which I was uh, pleased to assist with. And that program brought teachers in to schools where expert mentors were being well paid, where the teachers were getting a full salary, uh, more at the level of a um, a paraprofessional than a full teacher, but a very much a livable wage, uh, while they were getting a very, very um, um, supportive, uh, intensive uh, preparation for learning to teach. What we've seen across the country as more and more states are picking up this kind of practice, uh, which grounded on the medical residency model that gives teachers certification, you know, within that year of very well supported uh, financially and um, uh, in terms of learning to teach in, in, in terms of that model, that they then stay at much higher rates. We see uh, retention rates for teachers in residencies of 80 or 90 percent uh, over three to five years after uh, graduating. The mentoring that they receive in the years following the um, first year of practice, uh, not as teacher of record, but as um, uh, an apprentice, if you will, a resident under the wing of an expert teacher, uh, really produce that high retention rate. We also see that residencies typically are much more diverse um, on average across the country, when there was a recent study, about two thirds of residents were candidates of color. Uh, we certainly see that in the substantial residency programs in California. And we also see uh, from a number of studies that residents are viewed as highly effective by the principals who hire them and the superintendents and also get strong student outcomes. So this is a way that these programs, when they're vested in um, districts with close partnerships, uh, where uh, candidates then promise to teach for three to five years after graduating, that these programs then uh, end the problem of the churn uh, that creates ongoing shortages, 
create the pathway for very able, very well-prepared people to come into the profession and become leaders in the profession in that district uh, and really provide a different model, both for solving shortages and for pre preparing teachers. Uh, we now have a number of states. California has put more than $600 million into teacher residencies in the past few years uh, with a state investment of about 25000 per resident matched by the uh, partnering district. We just did a study in California and found that about 1,200 residents graduated last year. About 10% of the teaching force now is coming through residencies. They rated their programs the most highly of any pathway that um, candidates come through in California uh, and um, were uh, really um, well viewed in the districts in which they uh, prepared by their employers as well. So we've got you know, some headwinds uh, around really building an infrastructure. Other states, Texas has in invested $91 million of ESSER funds uh, into residencies. New Mexico, West Virginia, Montana, Mississippi uh, have all made significant investments. The uh, federal government um, has uh, investments possible through the Teacher Quality Partnership Program, uh, the Augustus Hawkins Centers of Excellence Program, which is particularly focused on historically Black colleges and uh, minority serving institutions. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, has funding that allows support for professionals coming in and preparing uh, for special education teaching. Uh, these programs uh, currently total about $200 million. Uh, they could be much more substantial over time and that would make a huge difference in the ways in which people come into the teaching profession. Another source of resources for affordable, high quality preparation is apprenticeship money. Uh, the first registered apprenticeship in K-12 teaching was approved by the Department of Labor last year. So this is a, a new approach. Uh, you know about apprenticeships in other fields where you learn under the wing of an expert um, and you get paid. Uh, it's a, a learn and earn strategy for coming into a profession. Uh, we'll learn more about this from Commissioner Schwinn. Uh, who's been doing amazing work in Tennessee on all of these uh, programs and strategies, uh, but they have uh, really been leading the way on the apprenticeship front. Uh, so they have uh, programs where paraprofessionals can earn a bachelor's and a teaching credential. Uh, and of course, people can tap their local Workforce Opportunity Investment Act funds, uh, as well as um, federal funds. Uh, if we design these apprenticeships in the right way, they should be very much like residencies. They should be integrated with coursework and uh, provide an increasing wage as you're undergoing preparation, so preparation becomes affordable. Uh, we can bring more diverse candidates into teaching. We can be really responsive to local workforce needs, and it can open up new sources of funds that haven't historically been used for teacher preparation. Uh, and so uh, the Department of Labor, for example, issued $121 million in Apprenticeship Builds America grants last year. And registered apprenticeship programs received $285 million in federal funds uh, in fiscal 23. So we've got many uh, strategies now. More states are coming online, trying to develop uh, res uh, apprenticeship models. Uh, and uh, according to one recent uh, report, the Department of Labor recognizes teacher apprenticeship programs in 16 states, uh, and more of them are joining. Uh, this work is still very new. Opportunities to learn from others in the field are very critical, which is one reason we're so excited about this panel today. Uh, these two models that I've just described are both uh, often using differentiated, differentiated staffing approaches where teachers may actually be, prospective teachers may be hired uh, as uh, um, paraprofessionals. In some cases, we've got a lot of people working on tutoring, which is another way to bring people into a paid uh, framework as they're doing clinical work and student teaching. Uh, and where we can be deliberate and purposeful about how to bring prospective teachers in to the profession through the paraprofessional route and through other helping roles in schools where they can be compensated, where they can be getting a very purposeful clinical uh, training 
Uh, and they can be there for that full year from the beginning when the students walk in the door to the end of that school year to see how it all unfolds over time uh, so that they can really be uh, contributors uh, and not uh, viewed as a, um, uh, a, a challenge for the school to accommodate, but as a resource and a contributor to the school's efforts with students. Uh, a real concern is keeping in mind the issues of quality in designing all of these new models. Uh, there's a danger given the severe shortages that so many states and districts have been facing that uh, the sort of training dimension, the support dimension uh, of residencies or differential staffing or apprenticeships could become another route into the profession where uh, teachers uh, Prospective teachers are thrown in as teacher of record with little support or actual apprenticeship under the wing of an expert teacher with their, you know, coursework supporting that clinical learning. So we've got to really be mindful of how to design these. Uh, policymakers need to think about that as do practitioners who are advising and creating these programs. Uh, there are efforts underway to provide guidelines to states and districts to inform some of this work and these, uh, these considerations around quality. Some of this work is happening through the Pathways Alliance, which is um, called, quote, an uncommon coalition of leading organizations that are dedicated to su um, supporting and implementing diverse uh, and inclusive educator preparation pipelines, including teacher residency programs uh, and apprenticeships, which Ed Prep Lab, AACTE, ASU, and LPI are all part of. Uh, and we hope that as we are really trying to deeply solve these parts of the dilemma that we've had around uh, quality preparation and uh, pathways into teaching that solve shortages, that we're really building uh, a new set of models that can last and maintain that um, quality dimension that will allow people to be well enough prepared to stay in the profession. These efforts do have to be accompanied by other policies. Uh, we need to create affordable, accessible pathways into the profession routinely. I came into teaching back in the 1970s on the National Defense Education Act uh, loans and loan forgiveness programs. The Urban Teacher Corps was uh, uh, happening at that time, along with a lot of other investments. Uh, we do need uh, service scholarships and loan forgiveness programs. We need to be sure that people can come into teaching without debt. We need to say as a nation and within our states that if you will teach, we will pay for your education, uh, as they do in other countries, where they understand that, you know, teachers' knowledge and skills is an investment uh, that has, pays off dividends for many, many, many years to come. We need to be sure that we're providing mentors for early career teachers. Uh, teachers who get good mentoring are twice as likely to stay as teachers who come in and don't get mentoring. So again, we need to support that learning process. We need to implement recruitment incentives to attract expert accomplished teachers to high need schools. Uh, we have a lot of schools in this country which are filled by a revolving door of inexperienced and sometimes underprepared teachers. And there aren't enough mentors in these schools to help bring the new teachers in in a way that will allow them to be successful. So for example, California just put in place $250 million uh, to pay stipends to national board certified teachers uh, who go into high poverty schools. They get $5,000 a year over five years as a, an added stipend uh, to be part of that school community to also enable them to be mentors. We know they are more effective than other teachers generally, and they're very effective mentors uh, as well, whose um, mentees uh, accomplish more in terms of learning gains with their students as a result of having had that expert mentoring. And finally, we need to create school conditions that allow teachers to be effective. Uh, moving beyond the factory model we inherited, uh, we know since the pandemic how important it is to put in place more personalized and relational school designs that allow students to be well known and teachers to work with fewer students for longer of periods of time and thus to be more effective as they work in teaching teams that share students, as they have block schedules, as they have advisory systems, as they have looping that allows them to stay with students. All of these things actually help teachers stay in schools longer because they feel that they can be effective and that's what really motivates them 
while students are getting more of what they need. Community school models uh, that offer wraparound supports, health and mental health services and nutrition and social services also support teacher retention uh, because kids are getting more of what they need and teachers can do their work in a more successful way. Uh, opportunities to uh, work in teaching teams and collaborate, a uh, time for that collaboration and professional learning. All of these things are part of a school redesign that some have undertaken and more schools need to undertake so that the life of a teacher uh, after they come in well-prepared and eager to contribute is one that is successful and sustainable. Um, all of these things, of course, are important right now uh, as we're approaching uh, the learning recovery that is needed in this post-pandemic era. I think we have a moment right now to uh, take this uh, opportunity to double down on creating a strong teaching profession in schools that are better organized to support their success. We all know that teaching is the profession on which all other professions depend. Our society needs great teachers to nurture great learners. Uh, people who are empowered to be curious and to imagine and to tackle the enormous problems we face uh, today and those we can't even yet foresee. So uh, it's a moment where we can be sure that our investments in teachers, our investments in our children and in our collective future. And we have a wonderful panel of amazing uh, policymakers uh, and uh, pre preparers of teachers uh, to really help us understand the practicalities of how to bring this vision into reality. Passing the ball back to you. Linda, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your being uh, with us here today and uh, your, your remarks were uh, wonderful uh, leading into our panel. Thank you. Um, well, we look forward to hearing uh, from Linda again at the conclusion of our panel discussion when she will rejoin us to provide some summary remarks before we proceed to our Q&A session. But right now, uh, I would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, we've brought together this uh, panel of distinguished education leaders uh, who will provide us with perspectives from across the field and at the national, uh, state, and local levels. Before we get started, uh, let me take a moment to introduce them. First, we have our moderator, Lynn Gangone, President and CEO of the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education. Uh, Dr. Lynn Gangone is President and CEO of AACTE. She is a seasoned education leader with education agency, association, and campus-based leadership experience. As a faculty member, campus senior administrator, association executive, and lobbyist and policy analyst, Dr. Gangone brings a unique perspective to our work. Now on to our panelists. Uh, first, we have Carol Basile, Dean of the Mary Lou, Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College at Arizona State University. Uh, Carol Basile is the Dean of uh, the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College at Arizona State, and her work has centered on redesigning the education workforce and workplace to drive more equitable working and learning environments for educators and learners. She's currently working with education organizations nationally and internationally to design new systems for educators and their students. Her prior research focused on math and science education, teacher education, and environmental education. And her recent co-authored book is entitled Next Education Workforce, How Team-Based Staffing Models Can Support Equity and Improve Learning Outcome. Next, Roberto J. Rodriguez who currently serves as Assistant Secretary for Planning, Evaluation, and Policy Development at the U.S. Department of Education, where he leads the development and review of the department's budget and advises the Secretary on all matters related to policy development, implementation, and review. Roberto's distinguished career in public service includes senior government roles in the White House and in the U.S. Senate. Most recently, Rodriguez served as President and CEO of Teach Plus. And finally, Penny Schwinn. Penny Schwinn was sworn, sworn in as Tennessee's Education Commissioner on February 1st, 2019. As Commissioner, Dr. Schwinn is committed to building on Tennessee's momentum over the last decade and plans to continue to accelerate growth through the state's strategic plan, Best for All, which focuses on high quality academics, student readiness and supports, and the state's strong current and future educators. 
Coming from a family of educators and committed to increasing access to an excellent education for all children, Commissioner Schwinn began her work as a high school history and economics teacher. She previously served in a number of roles in education, including Chief Deputy Commissioner of Academics, Assistant Superintendent, a school principal, and an elected school board member. Welcome to you all. We are looking forward to the discussion. And now I will turn it over to our moderator, Lynn Gango. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Learning Policy Institute at Ed Prep Lab and Bank Street College. Um, these three people are colleagues and friends. So I am anticipating a great conversation today. Um, to all of you online, welcome again. Um, I've already seen questions in the chat. And so we'll be moving through first some Q&A with our panelists, uh, and then we'll be joined back by Linda Darling-Hammond. And so I'm sure you'll have a lot to discuss while you're here with us today. We hope to get your juices flowing. So let me start first by asking all the panelists the following question. So from your unique vantage points, all of you have experience with emerging models of teacher preparation. And you heard Linda talk about those, residencies, apprenticeships, differentiated staffing, and workforce models. What are you seeing in terms of early implementation of these models? And then I have two sub questions, of course. The first is, what looks promising and, and are you seeing any potential challenges? And what types of outcomes are available to assess short-term effectiveness? So let me turn first to uh, Dean Basile, Carol Basile. Could you get us started? Sure. So I think every one of the things that Linda just talked about is a game changer, right? It's a game changer really for two reasons. One is that it's all really about clinical practice. Like there's nothing in there about like, we know what good, the good content is, but this leverages change in such a different way when we start thinking about st our students, right? Who are now paid, whether it's internships, whether it's residencies, um, lowering the cost, lowering time to completion, more authentic experience, um, increasing the quality of faculty, you know, experience and interaction and feedback. You can imagine, right? That if we could get this right, we could, I'm glad I'm doing this virtually, by the way, because nobody can throw anything at me, but because I'm going to say something. But imagine, right, that we could stop, we could actually replace student teaching, that student teaching, as we know it, could go away, because all of the clinical experience would actually get pushed back early and often, and, and be connected and attached to all of the things that we're teaching and be more authentic. And so that's a, that's a game changer for teacher preparation. The other part of this, right, is that we could then also so be thinking about as we are thinking about the different roles that these apprentices and paras and teaching assistants could play in the learning environment. We talk a lot about larger team-based learning environments, and these would, would help us to start thinking about new ways to credential, new technicians, uh, much like healthcare as we think about moving away from generalists, new opportunities for specialization, new opportunities for advancement. And so all of this, if it becomes a leverage for all of that, would be unbelievable. I always think of the model that you talk about, Carol, where you talk about how someone's treated in a hospital and how they have all of these specialists with varying expertise working together as a team. And, and I know you're gonna get into that a little bit more. Um, Assistant Secretary Rodriguez, Roberto, I would love to hear from you um, on thinking about what Dean Basile said and also some of your thoughts from the Department of Education's perspective. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lynn. And um, I'm just so thrilled to be part of today's conversation. I wanna echo the thanks to uh, the Learning Policy Institute and Bank Street College and uh, um, uh, Ed Prep Lab for organizing today's discussion. I can't think of a more important time for us to come together and have this discussion around how we prepare and support and lift up the next generation of our educators. Uh, you know, we have uh, the duality uh, of challenges that we're facing in this moment, right? Of the pandemic recovery uh, and the acceleration and support of student learning uh, and the continued and, and often too divisive politics around how and what we teach in our classrooms. So th this is the time for us to come together and to really embrace some new models and, uh, and to bring the evidence around what we know works around that clinical practice that Carol mentioned and that Linda outlined, 
alongside a longer duration of supporting uh, our teachers, not just in uh, in their pre-service program, but through induction and in mentoring and in thinking about how we support uh, our, that early career success of our teachers that we know is so important to their retention uh, in the field. Uh, you know, the magnitude of our teacher shortage is the dynamic that is looming uh, and that we've already discussed uh, this afternoon um, that is manifesting in all 50 states, right? We knew before the pandemic, the 10 years leading prior, we had about a third fewer uh, teacher candidates in our pipeline. Uh, we know even now, you know, that, that this shortage is not just about special education or STEM or bilingual or some of those classic um, shortage areas. It is across our schools and districts and rural and urban and suburban areas. So but we really see this as an opportunity for us to think about how can the federal government play a role in supporting and scaling evidence-based models, our residencies and our Grow Your Own programs, our opportunities to pioneer. And I know you'll hear from Commissioner Schwinn about this. They've been such a leader in Tennessee, uh, a registered apprenticeship model for our educators that adheres to high standards of quality, and that brings our institutions of higher education alongside our state leaders and our districts as partners. Too often in, in the past, uh, the way we've confronted some of these challenges around building the teaching profession, you know, we have these three discrete, you know, kind of systems of our districts and our ed prep programs and our policymakers. And, and how can we bring all of those together uh, and, and leverage some of the resources that we have in the system today. Uh, you know, Secretary Cardona just about a year ago put out some guidance to the field encouraging the use of the uh, American Rescue Plan dollars, those dollars that President Biden fought so hard to secure, to come alongside those um, HERF dollars and encourage our institutions of higher education and our district leaders and our state leaders to come together and surge capacity in high quality residency programs in doing more to knit together opportunities for our students to enter uh, the profession. We need more pathways that are accessible, are attainable, are affordable uh, for our teachers and that uh, adhere to what we know works relative to the evidence base and to the research here. So, you know, I remain very hopeful uh, you know, and hearing from and learning from so many leaders in the field that are leveraging the dollars in the here and now uh, to make progress. You know, we have about $2.6 billion in our federal resources that we're bringing alongside um, state leaders and institution leaders, higher ed leaders, local leaders uh, to make this a, a priority. Thank you, Roberto. And I said this to you during our practice session that you know, those of us in the field are incredibly appreciative to the Department of Education and for your leadership and the support at the federal level for the work that we're all doing. So uh, thank you very much on behalf of all of us. I'm seeing some conversation in the chat that reflects that, that as well, so thank you. Um, Commissioner Schwinn, um, it's been, you know, you and I have spent a lot of time together. We were at the White House together and I know that you've been doing some great work in uh, in apprenticeships, but more generally speaking, from your post as a state commissioner, would love to hear your remarks on on this question. Yeah, thanks so much, and I'll echo what others have said. It's just it's a delight to be on uh, on this panel today on and talking about something that we know is critical, especially in this moment. Um, it is something that I think across the country, state chiefs are spending a lot of time, energy, and investments in in trying to think about how do we get great folks um, interested in teaching? How do we get them through preparation programs that are going to ensure that they are successful once they're in front of our students? And then how do we keep them there? Um, and, and how do we think about that in a broad way? So uh, one of the things that we certainly have been focusing on in Tennessee is ensuring that we are very clear about what our data says. So what are our vacancies? Where are they? And then what who and where can we look to fill them? How do we kind of remove unnecessary requirements so that we are focusing on high quality um, preparation programs and candidates who, when they are in front of students on day one, are able to excel in their profession and continue to, to develop along the way? 
And so one of the things, obviously, in Tennessee, um, we've been focusing on the uh, the apprenticeship program. But I, I do want to say that before that, there's been a lot of work on residencies and really thinking about what must be true for our educators and our future educators so that on day one, they are confident, well-prepared, and ready for the students that they will be educating. And some of that work in the residency model, really thinking about on-the-ground practice, real-time feedback, um, looking at why teachers especially in their first four to five years, don't stay in the profession, and then trying to proactively address that has been work that's been going on in the state for, you know, well over five to 10 years. It's in that time frame. And so the apprenticeship program for us is really the next logical step to say, lots of great lessons learned, lots of great research out there, lots of other states and districts who have been doing this. How can we take it to the next level and look at what some of the barriers might be for our future educators to participate in these great programs? And so uh, the apprenticeship work, I think, is a really wonderful way in which we can ensure teachers become a teacher for free. They're paid to do so. Um, and on day one, there's no such thing as a first year teacher. Uh, I think about my first year. I think about the students that were in front of me and, and um, just how kind they must have been uh, to, to uh, Miss Lee when she was working her way through a first year teaching but under these types of models, we can erase this idea of a first year teacher because I mean, candidly, no student deserves a first year teacher. All of our students deserve really well seasoned educators. And we can do that if our preparation programs provide those opportunities for on the ground experience before day one. And we've been thrilled to see obviously the results in Tennessee. I know that's, um, one of kind of the sub questions, um, we're able to see things like our uh, our enrollment at the University of Tennessee is increasing and higher um, than it's been in a long time. So we're seeing that trend reverse. We're seeing higher uh, pass rates on Praxis scores for students who have been able to participate in similar programs. We're seeing that those future teachers who were part of apprenticeship and or residency based programs are retaining for longer and the achievement results of students in their classrooms are higher. We attend thousand children in the state of Tennessee who did not have a credentialed or licensed teacher in front of them when I walked in the door in 2019, and that's unacceptable. And so when we actually kind of remove ourselves from the adult problems and think about it from the perspective of students, this is the critical time to address it. And there are a, just a number of amazing solutions that I think are getting a lot of traction and acceleration. I absolutely agree. And I think the three of you spoke very well about what those various solutions are. It's exciting um, oftentimes we get caught up in the problems. And so one of the things I love about the three of you is that you're very solutions oriented and thinking always about what is it that we can do. Um, Carol, you're unmuted. Did you want to add anything or? No? Okay. Just trying to be a good moderator here. So let me um, ask you now, um, given our time, I actually want to move to some specific questions for each of you. And I'm going to start. Um, with Roberto. So uh, the Department of Education has expressed support for the work in Tennessee and in other states aimed at establishing and expanding new models of educator preparation. You have called on state policymakers, and you know, this is a thing I know that we're all concerned about, right? It's the states that make the policy. So we work to work with those state individuals. You work to set up guidelines, um, but we are asking state policymakers to establish teaching apprenticeships. And, you know, of course, we would say we would love those aligned with our educator preparation institutions, as it has been in Tennessee, um, invest in residencies, expand loan forgiveness and scholarship programs, and increase teacher compensation. You did speak to this a little bit in your opening remarks, but can you dig in a little bit on what kind of federal support is available now for states, programs, and districts that are implementing these policies? Sure, absolutely, Lynn. Well, I will just begin. And, you know, when you and I and and Penny sat down together with uh, Dr. Biden uh, in the Roosevelt Room and talked about this, we, you know, we were with Secretary Cardona and um, Secretary Walsh from the Department of Labor. The ability for us at the federal level to come together and institute a apprenticeship model and uh, pathway for our teachers that really is about a learn and earn approach, right, where, you know, affordability continues to be a big challenge in terms of entry into the profession uh, and, and particularly in those early years and being able to repay their loans. We've tried, we've made some changes to our public service loan forgiveness programs. In fact, we've been able to 
uh, forgive $24 billion in loans to over 2 million public servants. And we have some new changes in the works to our student aid and loan repayment system that will save our average public school teacher about $1,700 over the course of their loan repayment every year. Uh, but we still know that's that's been a big barrier. So we wanted we were interested in this apprenticeship model as a learn and earn approach, uh, and one that helps support kind of the grow your own models that was our that already existed in our states. Um, when we embarked upon that, we had a, only a couple states that were looking at that. We now have about a third of the states, as Linda mentioned, and I was just with a group of about fourteen state leaders yesterday who are beginning to evolve and grow and um, innovate around this work, we continue to stay focused on how we support quality standards in that effort. But it's just one example of, um, you know, a playbook. Uh, how do we think about a new playbook for how we address building and supporting a thriving uh, and diverse profession? Uh, and uh, again, we're talking today about teacher preparation, but this is only one piece of the broader work around how we re reinvigorate and elevate our teaching profession, right? And support that most noble profession to be the nation builders. I like to use that term. It's a term that Linda and I encountered when we were in Singapore visiting with teacher preparation programs and know, and understanding that, you know, these are the, those that are built at the helm of our classrooms, building the future of our learners and our leaders and our democracy. So that's gonna require us doing more to call states to action around teacher compensation, right? So that our teachers are not having to work two and three jobs or uh, you know, pay a 24 cents penalty on every dollar earned relative to other college educated peers. We have to do better there. We have to do better to forge policy that addresses some of the working conditions and uh, brings in more school counselors and more school social workers and others that can help to support the whole child and the mental health needs of our students. We have to do better to make sure that we're, uh, we're creating the and investing in the, um, in, in the supports that our teachers need and in the opportunities for them to lead beyond the four walls of their classroom. You know, our current uh, generation, if we're gonna attract and deeply prepare and support them, they wanna come into a profession where they know they can continue to grow, learn and lead, right? With their peers in a collaborative setting where they can work with their principals in helping to shape what curriculum looks like and how we're supporting our learners and how we differentiate and how we expand those that learning time and that one-on-one -on -one support for their success. And so, you know, part of that it also involves making those structural pivots and those structural changes that we need in our system. So we're eager to bring a lot of resources to bear there. You know, you heard some of those programs mentioned earlier, our SEED program, we have 22 new grants we've put out there, our teacher quality partnership program, over 20 grants there. You know, I know Carol has um, leveraged some of the wonderful American Rescue Plan dollars there in Arizona to help surge support. So, you know, it's an all hands on deck effort here for us and using those dollars to support deeper, more evidence-driven preparation models, uh, build a new playbook, and then support some of those other pivots that we know are needed to, to um, build a strong profession. That's great. And I appreciate what you said about teacher agency and engagement and collaboration. And in that regard, I do want to pivot to Carol. Um, you know, we've talked a bit about apprenticeships here, but I would really love for Carol to dig in on the model that certainly I and AACTE have been following for a, a number of years now, the Next Education Workforce model. Um, this is one of those innovative approaches. So Carol, can you um, help us think through alongside you what you see the, are the unique features of this model and how you see it meeting the more contemporary needs that, that we have in education today? Thanks, Lynn. Um, you know, this is, you know, this is not about teacher preparation. This is bigger than teacher preparation, right? So this is really, as we think about it, it's a human capital systems model. And so we basically say that what we want to 
be able to do is to provide all students with deeper and personalized learning. I think that's the right direction. We have to be learner centered. We have to think about deeper personalized. We need to think about how we use technology by building teams of educators with distributed expertise. And so it begins with starting to really rethink. You had asked this question about what are the challenges in all of this and your very, very first question, which you probably didn't answer. But the very, very hardest challenge in this, right, is to get people to envision something different than the one teacher, one classroom model. Because I don't care how we prepare them, that job is not humanly possible today. And I say a lot that during the pandemic, we learned two things. One is that people want flexibility and they don't want to be isolated. And teaching is both, right? It is inflexible and it is isolating. And so our, our, the work that we are doing now with over 70 school systems across the country is to start looking at how we build teams of educators. How do you take the people who are there? How do we think about how, with the role of teacher preparation and all of this? How do we think about people who have new roles, who have new ways of doing, who are these sort of you know, technicians, just like we think about it, we see in healthcare, but people who also specialize. People, paras who now have specialties, they're not underprepared generalists. Uh, they actually are trained, right, to have specialties, that they're going in laser focused with jobs, apprentices, right, that have specialties. So now you've taken, you know, a couple courses at the university and you're a teacher candidate. Now you are a reading accelerator. That's your job. And we have a job description for that. And so we start to think about ways that people can, can enter the profession. We think about community educators and everybody in the community actually know something about how to teach, that we, that we actually professionalize the profession, um, that we think about specializations. We've built in nine credit hours of specialization in our teacher prep program because we think everybody needs to have some kind of specialization. And oh, by the way, it's not just things in education. It's things like digital media. Uh, it's, it's working with indigenous populations. It's all kinds of things across the university um, that we know, right, as we see demographics change in kids that we think is important. And then it's also about advancement. And then it's looking at HR systems. So the other grant that we have uh, is the TSL grant, which is actually helping us to work with Mesa Public Schools right now on really looking at their whole human resource system, teacher evaluation, uh, all, the, all of those kinds of things, right, that have been built for a one teacher, one classroom model, our accountability systems that have been built, um, pushing us back to that one teacher, one classroom model. Um, we are really, really trying to think about the fundamental structures of all that so that all of these things then can be leveraged and you think about all the people who could come in and work in teams uh, with distributed expertise. I, you know, one of the things I love is the way that the Mesa School District has taken the lead with you. You know, I mean, I think a lot of times, you know, all of us talk about probably points of inflection, right? Ways in which we can look at that system and say, how can we introduce innovation? But it takes partnership. And you really have found a strong partner in the Mesa School District so that you're able to bring your candidates in and, and to do this different way, I think, but much more um, satisfying way of bringing um, individuals into the profession. So, you know, kudos to you in Arizona State. Um, you know, Penny, you, you know, you know how much we are all the buzz is teaching apprenticeships, teaching apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. um, I think that probably a lot of folks don't necessarily understand yeah. what that means. I know that, you know, Austin P State University and Clarksville Montgomery School District were the first Department of Labor approved teacher apprenticeship. And from there, you have taken the ball and run with it. You now have a center at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. But, you know, try to disassemble this for folks. You know, what, what, um, what are these efforts really about? How have they met the state specific needs of Tennessee? And how do you see this model developing in other states? We certainly see that starting to burgeon across the country. Yeah, appreciate that. It is, uh, it, it is complicated, right? And so I think, you know, a lot of the work that we've seen, and I, you know, we've heard about this um, from a number of folks, it started a long time ago. And it's really about kind of taking the next big step. And so we had um, some great leadership in Clarksville Montgomery School District. I think this is a, a really strong example of when there are great seed ideas in our school districts, the state can then take that and make it something bigger. And then the federal government can take that and make that something national. And so you see that stair step along the way. And so we've been really, really proud, um, especially of Clarksville um, and, and what they've been able to do. So for us, it was really about looking at what 
are the problems that we're trying to solve? And in Tennessee, we've consistently had a thousand teachers vacancies in the state um, and about a thousand just over uh, teachers who are on permits or waivers. And that number should be zero, ideally. Um, that is our goal across the board. And so what we had been doing are ver were versions of scholarships or financial incentives, but that wasn't a sustainable way in which to remove some of the barriers into the profession. So by looking at it through the apprenticeship angle, we know that then that removes a lot of those financial barriers. And our original, um, we had a Grow Your Own 1.0 and 2.0. We now have nine educator prep providers across the state who are participating, um, 200 candidates, in addition to the 650 who have already gone through. So in just a period of three, three and a half years, we are cutting our vacancies in half across the state. And now close to two thirds of our districts reported that they did not actually have vacancies um, going into the school year. It, is, it has been pretty tremendous to see the growth and acceleration and it is possible in a short period of time. We should not set an expectation that doing something bold has to take 10 years for it to work. It means that we have to be thoughtful, targeted, strategic and urgent. And by having really strong partnerships, we've been able to move quite quickly. So for us, from an apprenticeship um, perspective, we have a number of programs. We've got the BA program, um, which is kind of the, the traditional. We've got the masters, which a lot of our districts like in terms of additional credentialing. Um, and then we're also building out this partnership with our teaching as a profession uh, programs of study in high school. So our future teachers in high school, because we know and we've read all the, the great research coming out of our universities, that, that students are now making those decisions quite early. Not what they want to do, but they're, they're removing teaching as an option much earlier than maybe Maybe they would have before. So we have some we have some of our high school programs where they're able to do two years of kind of the initial study and and coursework um, that you might get in an AA degree and in some of our early uh, post secondary opportunities in high school, and then they're able to transition seamlessly into some of these programs. And so it's really about saying whether you're a high school student, a career changer, a retiree, um, someone who just wants to be a teacher and in their, in their BA program, there has to be a very clearly articulated pathway for all of those folks. So once they decide that they wanna be a teacher, um, they, we, the UT Center is actually a wonderful way in which we're trying to centralize this. They're able to fill out a super quick form online. They say, look, here's what we're interested in. Here's where we want to live. And then we can match that potential future teacher with a school district. That's been game changing for us because it's, it's simplifying the process of being able to say, I'm a district, I need a, a special education teacher or a math teacher versus just saying, hey, call your local district and hopefully the match works. We can be much more intentional that way. Um, once that is in place, the district is able to hire that, that person as an uh, apprentice. And so they are a paraprofessional in a classroom with a mentor or master teacher. They're able to then start coursework um, at any either UT system or the other ed preps um, who are participating in the program. They're getting paid a living wage, which means that we're removing financial barriers for career changers. And those folks who have a mortgage and kids and something else, and they, they can't actually just stop working to go back to school. They now get that living wage that increases as a requirement of being an apprentice every single year. So they're getting a, an increase every year. They're able to do their courses at night or on the weekends. They get incredible help, such as tutoring services for the praxis. The great story that I love is um, we are removing some of the um, notion that, that uh, just certain kinds of people can be teachers. We've got great people that life happened um, and they are smart and capable and wonderful. And this is their dream. Um, whether that's the custodian or the bus driver, the nutrition worker, the, the stay-at-home parent, they're able to now do this job that they've wanted to do forever, and they're phenomenal at it. And so they've been, we've been able to help through the apprenticeship work because if the car breaks down, if you're a registered apprentice, apprentice dollars actually can cover that. Um, we had a mom who didn't have childcare to get to school or work. Some of the apprenticeship dollars allow you to cover that. It just provides a so just a, a much more incredibly supportive environment for those folks who are making the big leap into a profession that we all know is incredibly important. And so for us, um, we've seen uh, obviously pretty strong success in, in just the interest. We're seeing our first apprentices in the classroom, which is very exciting. You get kind of nervous for them, um, but they are, they are doing very, very well. And most importantly, is it is about professionalizing the profession. 
I know that teachers, um, we all feel that this is a very hard job and it is a very important job. And the way we talk about teachers has got to change. And so when you see that, I think the apprenticeship model actually really helps to highlight how hard the job is to do well, how important the job is, and ensures that our future teachers are given the structures and opportunities to try and fail in a safe space with a great leader in the classroom who's helping them grow so that on day one, they are ready for our kids. But I think the one thing that I do wanna just mention is this idea of we can't just get them in the classroom, we gotta keep them there. Uh, when, when I started this job, Tennessee had a minimum salary of $34,000. And when you think about that in 2019, and we, we're now up to $40,000 and we're going to keep going, um, but it, it is a pretty sizable increase. But I think that we have to show the investment, not just in future teachers, but we have to show the investment in the entire profession so that folks understand that when they sign up to be a teacher, it's, it's, it is service, but it is also something where they will be respected. And so um, this apprenticeship program removes the financial barriers. It diversifies the profession. It addresses getting teachers into the jobs where there are vacancies, not just teachers into a pool where we don't, maybe we don't need any more elementary teachers over here, but we need a lot of science teachers. We can be much more data-driven. Um, and then I think it just opens the door for a lot of folks who maybe didn't think about the profession and for the first time realize they can become a teacher and be really good at it and our kids are better off. What I love about what each of you have said is you really are taking a systems approach. You're looking at um, relationships, which are often hard to, to build, right? And, and you're building them, you're building trust, you're coming up with, you know, innovation is not an overused term. I had to alarm myself to make sure I was bringing the panel to close appropriately. But you know, some of each of the each of you are doing incredible work, and you know, right now I know that we need to wrap up this section of the panel. I had many more questions to ask each of you, but I'm certainly, um, you know, I'm certainly certain that you've given everyone who's in this webinar an opportunity to really think about um, what you're doing and. You know, we're going to bring Linda Darling Hammond back into um, our world here to have her summarize your comments. Please, I would encourage the audience, if you have more questions of any of our colleagues, please do check in with them. I know Carol put her email in the chat. I'm sure that the others would welcome your questions. And I see Linda has come back on video. So welcome, Linda. <laughs> Thank you. I am switching places in my den because um, my uh, battery is running out. So <laughs> that's how uh, I usually this, see you on Zoom. You know, I like the books in the background, but this is how I know you on Zoom. Yeah, I'm usually I'm sitting on this couch. So I just I'll make just a couple of comments. Um, one is, uh, as you just already said, everybody brings such a systemic approach, and I think that's really important because you know we in this country can kind of innovate ourselves to failure. We have an approach where we're like always oh, starting this new project or this new project and funders often will, you know, give you a little bit of money and then you give you three years to get that thing done. And it's very uh, disconnected from the whole context that the root cause analysis tells us we have to solve. So I really appreciate the way people are thinking about all the components that have to be dealt with in policy and practice. Um, you know, the fact that um, Commissioner Swin said, um, you know, that um, the, there should be nobody who's uh, doing a first year of teaching on that first day, that we should have that experience base that, you know, that uh, however it occurs through deep student teaching, apprenticeship, uh, residency, that people are coming in and they really know how to do this work. And they've seen that full year of teaching unfold in a partnership context with uh, others who can really help them do that. So it's just critically important. And then of course, Penny, you named all the other features of the profession that have to be attended to. And I really uh, appreciate that. Uh, you know, uh, in addition to the way we bring people in, I really appreciated uh, the way in which Assistant Secretary Rodriguez was talking about uh, we need to grow, lead, and learn throughout the profession. And I know that your work with Teach Plus and all the wonderful teachers there really uh, reinforces the 
you know, the trajectory of the, the occupation of the profession and how people need to come in in the right ways with all of those supports and that capacity, and then also be able to grow, lead, and learn beyond that. Uh, and think about all the ways in which the, I know you're thinking about all the ways in which the federal government can support that whole profession. And I really look forward to, you know, some deeper um, uh, opportunities, uh, you know, at the federal level to support this work in the states. One of the things we're learning is that when the federal government uh, is connected to what states are doing. When we've got that interplay where the work of the, the federal level is to uh, incentivize and partner and reinforce, you can get so much more done than when it's just everybody doing you know, individual innovations all by themselves. And then Carol, I just so appreciated the way in which you talked about busting out of the egg crate classroom. <laughs> <laughs> which we inherited from the factory model uh, where, you know, one teacher in each little egg crate doing their own thing. And, you know, we used to have one student teacher with each of those one teachers that we have to conceptualize the school. We see this in effective redesigned schools. They conceptualize the school as a, a unit in which Teachers are working on shared practices in which teams are sharing students in which differentiated roles are connected. And part of that team that is working with children. Uh, and that's really part of getting out of that sort of bureaucratic factory model assembly line approach in which everyone is disconnected doing one thing. Uh, and the student is not getting a coherent holistic experience nor is the entering teacher. So I think we've put a vision for what the new system of education ought to be on the table. And um, it'll be fun to hear what uh, Q&A uh, comes from the audience as they're taking this in. And there is a lot of Q&A. There's Q&A in the chat. There's Q&A in the question and answer. Um, so let me see if I can get us started here. I, there's a there's a question specifically about um, well there's a number of questions let's talk about this first there's a number of questions about how we actually retain teachers so a number of questions in the chat on that and I, you, you know each of you have talked about the importance of all of the pieces of the pathway right you know Penny you talked about getting that high school student interested and also perhaps that career changer, right? And bringing those two into the mix. You know, Carol, you've talked a lot about community educators and bringing in some, you know, ways in which we can create a more robust team-based environment where individuals have agency. And Roberta, you've talked a lot about how the federal government is supporting, um, not just, you know, addressing the teacher shortage from a preparation perspective, but also from a retention perspective. So would any of you like to just comment on um, teacher retention at this point, since there are so many questions in that regard? I know it's a tough one. I mean, well, I'm I happy to. Um, <laughs> are you getting <laughs> No, go um, ahead, Penny. Go ahead, Penny. <laughs> okay. Um, I, you know, ju just because it's obviously very front of mind for us, um, we look at kind of retirement eligibility within, within our state on top of what we see as kind of normal transition that might happen. Uh, and, it, and it is something, especially when you look at special education, um, uh, ESL teacher, science and math, like we have the same vacancies that I think you see across the, across the country. What we have found, I mean, we, we've done a lot of work with educators in terms of um, our survey. We have an annual survey that we give. We have about 72% response rate of educators in the state who participate in an annual survey. So we have really good data on Tennessee specific um, educators. And it, it, it comes down to the things that, that aren't going to be surprising, right? It's um, compensation. It is culture and climate within the school building and school leadership, um, how they feel in that in those relationships and how much support they get, and whether or not they have the resources. And that's not just textbooks and pens and pencils and copy paper, but that's also time. And I think um, we certainly heard Linda talk about that earlier. But do I have the time to adequately and sufficiently prepare my classroom so that when I walk in the door, I know I'm giving my students the best education possible? So those are the things that I think are really big problems to solve. And 
sometimes a little bit easier um, than, than some of the others, but I don't think you can do one or the other. If you're not showing due diligence and trying to make the conditions of being a teacher better, then it is a really hard sell to try to get people into the profession. And so balancing both has got to be um, a priority. And I think certainly coming out of the pandemic, I saw a number of questions there. We, we really have to ensure that we are thinking about all of our responsibility within our school buildings, which extends certainly beyond some of the things that we might traditionally talk about. If I could just add one footnote on that, um, part of what Penny is saying is that leader preparation is part of the pathway to teacher retention. We've got to prepare school leaders who are ready to do the redesign of schools. It's not about just making schools, you know, managing the school as it is. It's about designing a new school that's ready for what we can do in this century and what our kids need. And of course, it's not only that teachers will stay in a school where they feel supported, they have a collegial environment, et cetera, uh, but they need to be part of that uh, shared decision-making around that redesign. So leader preparation is really a key uh, aspect to teacher recruitment and retention. Yeah, and that's certainly, I think, what Carol and her team at ASU are doing in, in terms of really looking at the, the redesign. Of, of how we do the work. Roberta, you had been unmuted, excuse me. No, it's great, Lynn. I love the conversation. I think this redesign is also about how we think about intentional knowledge and skills and attributes that we're building um, for our principals and our teachers together to embrace more of a distributed leadership model, right? How are we thinking about, you know, our teachers not just being uh, deep pedagogists and able to really differentiate their learning, but lead other adults and support and how do we think, as Linda said, about this differentiated roles and responsibilities being mutually reinforcing and supporting um, one another in a learning environment uh, for our teachers and for our students? You know, the other thing that I would just add into this is to have the intentionality from a policy perspective of focusing on retention, right? Not just recruitment. We've had national efforts going back. I've been part of many evolutions of federal policy that have looked at the importance of recruitment into the profession, we can at the district and state level also think about what are our goals and aspirations for building and supporting a workforce that is diverse and thriving and, and growing and leading. And it, the more we can focus on the data points there, and you know, as Penny mentioned, also have uh, some voices of our teachers reflected in that data write that survey that is, you know, you, when you talk to our educators, they will tell you what those conditions are that matter most to staying in and thriving in their field, right? So we need to have policy making that is more responsive to that effort too. Carol, you had unmuted. Do you want to join in here? Yeah, I just want to, yeah, I just want to, I, I have a caveat to all of this, which is I, I don't, We've talked a long time about that this is a recruitment and retention challenge, right? And I'm not sure that it is. I think it's a workforce design challenge. And I think we have to really think about what we're doing and how we think about that. That if we think that retention is now about keeping teachers in the, in the field for 10 or 20 or 30 years, like we've always thought about teaching, I don't think that's a reality. So the other part of this is how do you build systems for that churn? Because the churn is going to happen. So a first grader, right, my granddaughter who's in kindergartner, right, she's got one teacher. If that teacher leaves, there's nobody in that school who knows my granddaughter, right, when she goes to first grade. If she had a team, there's a lot of people who would know, right? And then you're managing, so you're managing that churn as these kids also move. So there's an advantage to starting to think about retention as working condition, but also in, in as, as the way we think about how teachers work together. So yes, I think we can I think we can increase retention maybe by a year, maybe two, maybe three. But I don't think this generation is going to stay. I think they're looking for more. And I think we also have to think about advancement. We have to think about team leads. We have to think about, you know, cross team leads, other opportunities, right, for people to advance, not just school leadership. We've said we've talked about that for a long time. So so this is about a total restructure, but it's also not thinking about it as a retention. It's really thinking about this as a workforce design structural issue, because that churn is going to happen and we can't prevent it. And we're not if we keep trying to do that and try keep preventing that because we want we're in this one teacher one classroom model i don't think we're going to we're going to get there i'd like to just respond to that by um saying that you know we do see different attrition rates across the country just as we see them differently in different 
um, countries and so on. Uh, so I don't know that we have to accept the notion of churn in the way that it's happening now. Um, you know, there, if you are in the Northeast- I agree with that. <laughs> people do come in, they want a career in teaching. But I think to your point, teaching can mean leadership roles in the profession as well as the work that you do initially when you first come into the profession. So I think it's, as you said, it's workforce redesign uh, and the roles that you might take on, which might be roles that take uh, up mentoring and uh, you know, school redesign and a variety of other things, even including uh, becoming a teacher preparer, um, should be connected in ways, and I think this is your key point, that we're building a coherent a profession, a coherent school environment, uh, you know, and, and a uh, set of options and pathways for people that use their talent and expertise, uh, you know, and, and that then becomes part of the professional knowledge base and expertise base, rather than the kind of churn we're seeing now, which is in and out, and we lose, you know, all of that knowledge walks out the door, and it doesn't go anywhere to reinforce what we're trying to build. If I can jump in totally. just really quickly, because I, I agree with that. And I think one of the things to loop to what um, we've been working with the U.S. Department of Education on, and I, I don't want to lose the power of the federal relief dollars and what that's been able to do for us to even rethink structuring within schools. So you take yeah. tutoring, right? Lots of conversation on kind of high doses tutoring, et cetera, et cetera. What we've been able to do is say, that's that's great. And if you can hire a future teacher as a full-time employee within the school system, that full-time tutor is now building those relationships with the students in classrooms. There is a natural respect and connection between the teacher, maybe now an apprentice, maybe that tutor is also an, is going to become an apprentice. You've created three layers of professional development and growth, and now three people who are deeply committed to that student. So that when and if that teacher leaves, you now have someone who can fill that vacancy and that child is feeling the continuity of that support. And I think that if we can think differently about how, how we can layer a person in a classroom and remove this idea that to it kind of grow in the profession means you leave the classroom. Let's actually create some stratified experiences so that people feel um, that they can grow, they can make more money, they can see professional development, but more importantly, that students are seeing the wraparound supports by a number of adults who are there and they feel that consistency day to day. So I agree with I agree with everything that's just been said. It's it's I just think that intentional strategy and planning is is important to do at a systems level and then really help districts implement that. Yeah. Anyone else want to jump in? This is a great, this is great. This, I, I, you know, I don't know if all of you can see this, but there's thumbs up and claps and all these like <laughs> emojis coming up through as each one of you talk. I think there's a lot of excitement, certainly about what each of you have said. Um, I'm going to wrap it up and uh, turn it over to uh, my colleagues at LPI. I, I wanna thank everyone for participating. I think you can see why when I talk to all of these people, I get super excited about the future of the profession and what we can do to create change um, in the face of what some days seems like undaunt undaunting challenges. So thank you everyone. And Steve, I'm gonna turn it over to you for some closing remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Lynn. And I wanna take a moment to uh, to again thank all of our presenters for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate your time and your sharing your thoughts and creating a, a vibrant and informative discussion. Uh, I'm sure folks will be talking about it for some time as there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I'd also like to thank our attendees. We hope you've enjoyed your time with us and that you're leaving with some new understandings and perspectives. Uh, we also hope you'll join us for upcoming events in this year's Learning Cafe series focused on whole child school de sold design principles and teacher preparation sold design principles. As Maria described, these deeper dives into the science of learning and development, also highlighting the work of Ed Prep Lab members, are meant to inspire broader conversations about and wider efforts to build teacher and school leader preparation aligned with these principles. Uh, so in closing, we at Ed Prep Lab have been excited to put on this event and we look forward to future engagement with you. Uh, please feel free to reach out to any of our staff with questions 
or if you'd like to learn more about ways to become involved with EdPrep Lab. A uh, recording of this webinar will be made available on the EdPrep Lab website in a few days. Look for an email announcing it when it's up, and please feel free to share it uh, widely. Uh, finally, I'd like to mention that a survey will appear in your window when you leave this webinar, and we'd appreciate your feedback. Uh, we hope you will have a wonderful day. Uh, thank you again for sharing this time with us.